Okay, hello everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a book by Ellen Makeson's Wood called The Origin of Capitalism. And uh, in this class that I'm teaching this semester and, and in this lecture series, we're looking at the history of uh, capitalism and different theories about that. And in the last talk, uh, I introduced some of Marx's ideas from uh, Capital Volume 1, especially, uh, and we looked at, uh, in particular, what he had to say about uh, primitive accumulation. Okay, so that was kind of one starting point that we're using um, for our investigation. Um, but there are lots of places we can take off from there. And the next, for the next kind of talk in this series, then I wanted to look at uh, Ellen Mason's Wood uh, and her Origin of Capitalism text um, because she brings up a number of um, additional points which Marx also touches on, but um, Wood really, Mason's Wood really um, brings them to the fore. I think, uh, and she also then sets the stage by doing that for some of the other histories of capitalism that um, kind of sets the theoretical stage, I should say, for, for our investigation of um, other studies of the history of capitalism that we'll be looking at um, and that I'll be introducing in later talks. So it's a very important text. I wanted to put it right at the beginning. Um, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it's pretty short, um, relatively, considering the topic that it is uh, dealing with, and um, quite eye-opening, I think, uh, uh, probably for, for many people, okay? So uh, let's get into it here. And <clears throat> here's my... Um, Simple introduction slide. Again, Ellen Mason's Wood, The Origin of Capitalism, <clears throat> um, published before this, but the copy I had was um, from Verso, in, put out in 1999. Okay. All right. Um, and right away in the introduction, so Mason's Wood, she, she takes about the first half or maybe third of the book to kind of um, pick apart the previous histories and theories of the origins of capitalism, okay? And, and this is really important, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a literature review, a little bit of critique especially, um, but her, her big point of contention, right, is that most historical accounts take capitalism for granted as if it's always existed, as if it was preordained or if it's just a natural state of affairs. And if that is the case, if, if capitalism is an, a natural situation, as um, some proponents of, many proponents of classical political economy would uh, like to suggest, you know, we're all, um, <clears throat> that then in that case, there would be, she said, no origin, right? Um, and she also points out that most historians like to uh, see seeds of capitalism in early exchange. So it's like there's this desire for capitalism um, that's always existed throughout humanity, right? And you can you can clearly see how this narrative of history, in fact, just justifies our present economic system. Um, and then she notes also that most people like to think of capitalism as a liberating force, right? This is Again, I mean, this is class. This is a tenet of classical political economy, right? Um, the free market, free choice, opportunity, etc. But um, of course, and as any Marxist uh, analysis will point out, what classical political economists miss is that all of this is not really free. It's predicated on force or lack of choice, and the key way in which Mason's Wood um, 
shows this, and, and what she's so keen on emphasizing is, is precisely this, that people are compelled to buy and sell goods or their labor because they can't survive if they don't. It's a simple principle, right? Um, you don't work, you don't eat, okay? Um, that, that's what it is. So this is the so-called, quote, uh, uh, freedom that classical political economists are, are so excited about. Um, but it's, you know, Marxists would say, well, this is, this is not really a freedom. And, and there's many other ways in which it's unfree, but, but Mason's Wood is going to emphasize especially this very basic principle in a few different ways, okay? And so she starts out then looking at these previous models. And the first one she looks at is the commercialization model and its legacy. And in the commercialization model, proponents of that would say that, that capitalism is the natural state of affairs, and they would say the same for growth and innovation, and that societies just had to break free from the constraints of past systems, feudalism especially, to achieve capitalism. So, in other words, this is a justification of the present, as I said, and that in this historical view, now would be the apogee of greatness, or the end of history, if you will. Um, and the commercialization model um, proponents of this would also see rentierism as parasitic, uh, cities as being early embryos of capitalism, and they would see uh, different forms of commerce, exchange, wealth, and development all growing into capitalism, right? So it's this natural, like, evolution of, of history and while everything's just getting better and great, right? But Wood says um, it's the opposite, that capitalism, she sees it as a radical shift, not a natural process. And this is contra the commercialization proponents who see feudalism as a radical break in the natural continuity of historical progression, okay? So, so it's, it's completely opposite what she's saying. No, feudalism didn't hinder the progression towards capitalism. Rather, capitalism is the radical shift which has disrupted, in a way you could say, even the flow of history, okay? And then she looks at another model, the demographic model. And, and this is just a slightly updated uh, version of the commercial model. It sees the development of capitalism as either being hindered or assisted by supply and demand and demographics. Okay? And there's another, system sh uh, another model she looks at, the world systems theory. And she says this is also a variant of the commercialization model. Some Western states developed while others didn't. And within the world systems theory, there's also, an, of course, an element, it, it notes, of colonial exploitation going on this. But she says that, nevertheless, this view is still just a quantitative expansion of um, commercial activity to capitalism. And then she points out that, you know, one of the first people to challenge this really um, in a, in a meaningful way was Karl Polanyi. And he said there have always been markets, but that this is not the same as a market economy. There are other ways of organizing society than the profit motive. A market economy, writes Wood, makes sense Wood, can exist only in market society. That is, a society where instead of an economy embedded in social relations, social relations are embedded in the economy, okay? And she's prefacing Polanyi's views here, right? Pointing out the importance of how now um, everything, all human social relations become mediated through the market. And so th this is why it's not just a market economy, it's a market society. And this completely uh, uh, alters human social relations. And Polanyi also argued that the shift to a market economy was a disruptive break from the past. And this is what Mason's Wood has said, and she agrees with this. But for him, the great transformation was the Industrial Revolution, which altered social relations, production, etc. 
And he never questions this either. It just seems to be inevitable in his narrative, which she points out is also very Western-centric. And she dwells on this point a little bit and talks about Eurocentrism in previous histories of capitalism. And many tend to take it for granted that European modernization uh, and uh, Europe, that Europe, uh, sorry, modernized and developed capitalism first, allowing them to develop ahead of other nations. The so-called great transformation that accompanied the Industrial Revolution, right? Um, and other non-Eurocentric accounts, um, you know, focus on the important roles of other nations, but they share the assumption of a certain model or progression of the development of history, which leads to capitalism. <laughs> okay. So, even if they're critical of capitalism, even if um, they're saying that, you know, other nations, non-Western nations, also developed capitalism in this way, they're still maintaining um, the uh, idea that this kind of progression to capitalism is uh, inevitable, right? And they also take it for granted that primitive accumulation was simply accumulation of wealth under commercial society, which enabled capitalism. And Woods notes that Marx, uh, or Wood notes that Marx argued against this, saying that primitive accumulation is not just wealth and profit, uh, but it's rather quote a social relation, and quote the transformation of social property relations. And I I tried to show this a little bit in my previous talk on Marx's Capital, Volume 1. So all these accounts see capitalism as arising naturally out of earlier market forms, and it was impeded along the way in this view by feudalism, um, usually, but it was allowed to develop in Europe, and this was further enabled by technical technological advances. So none really see capitalism as quote, a specific social form with, quote, distinctive social relations. And as a result, they do not answer how capitalism came into being. How did these distinctive social relations come into being, right? If they gave rise to capitalism, how did that come into being, okay? And then she looks at even debates within uh, the Marxist tradition, tradition and their, um, you know, different views of uh, of history, right, and historical, uh, quote, I guess you could say, progression. Um, so along came Marx first, and he saw that wealth does not equal capitalism. So that early wealth buildup alone would not be enough to produce capitalism. This is arguing against very various different commercialization models, mercantilist schools, um, etc., stuff like that. You, you've got a bunch of money? Okay, great that doesn't necessarily make you a capitalist. And it doesn't mean that society becomes capitalist, right? Rather, primitive accumulation for Marx meant the transformation of social property relations. And this is why in that uh, talk on Marx, I emphasize so much the uh, relations between farmers and landlords. And, and this is key for Mason's Wood as well. The real primitive accumulation is when people are compelled to enter certain social relations, namely the wage relationship, that is, to sell their labor for wages and reinvest in surplus value. Also for Marx, capitalism had a definite beginning and an end, and it was not in any way a natural or inevitable process. And then Mason's Wood goes uh, to investigate, she goes on to investigate the thought of another uh, famous uh, Marxist, Perry Anderson. Um, and he saw feudalism as a fusing of political power and economy under sovereigns. And they themselves were fragmented, but with the growth of money rents and commodity production, feudal lords lost their grip on power. They united their power instead under a central state authority, such as forming something like absolutism, and political power thus shifted up. But the economy was allowed to develop on its own. Uh, and later, the bourgeois, uh, bourgeoisie seized power through 
bourgeois revolutions. And this is Perry Anderson. Now she's summarizing his views. So Wood says Anderson's argument is just a, quote, refinement of the commercialization model, which sees capitalism emerging naturally once freed from the, quote, bonds of feudalism. Okay, so the separation of political power and economic power that gave way for the transition from feudalism into, and then it allowed the, the economy to develop on its own into, from more, uh, into more market uh, economy and capitalism, right? So Wood poses uh, the, the major problem again with most prior scholarship, which is that it assumes the very thing that needs to be explained, she says, in seeking the origins of capitalism. That is, they saw elements of it already present and that these just had to fully emerge into developed capitalism. But then she says, along came Robert Brenner. And he distinguished between the peasants who own land and were not subject to market imperatives, this is a key term for Mason's Wood, by the way, and tenants who rented the land and were subject to market imperatives, okay? Now, this is quite uh, key. Um, <clears throat> moreover, the landlords were also dependent on the productivity of the tenants, so new social relations emerged and with new rules for reproduction. And this is agrarian capitalism. Wood says this is specific to England, especially where it started. So that both peasants and tenants were subject to market imperatives and focused on increasing growth and productivity. This is now the beginning of where Wood uh, really... Uh, she notes the origin of capitalism and what is so different from previous scholarship, but she's still kind of drawing off Robert Brenner, who also pointed this out, right? This, this, this distinction between peasants who own the land and tenants who rented the land, okay? But eventually, even the ones who own the land, as we've already seen in, a, in the previous talk, became subject to market imperatives eventually, right? Because... Um, the price, through different prices of commodities um, and eventually through uh, uh, set prices of, of land, etc., and how much, uh, based on ideas of how much a certain plot of land should be able to produce. But she says the separation between <coughs> lords' peasants and land on, landowners' tenants is key because it distinguishes between the ruling classes, and the surplus extracting classes. Now, this is also key, right? Um, there is a distinction here. The bourgeois, she'll later point out, do not necessarily equal capitalism. Bourgeois do not equal capitalists. Okay, there's a, there's a distinction. Um, and I've pointed this out too, and Marx pointed this out, that peasants under feudalism gave a portion of their surplus labor to the lords, but then that was it. Whereas landlords... Are all they put all of the emphasis on continually extracting um, that surplus, and that this how much surplus they should extract is determined by um, the market. Okay, um, <clears throat> so a purely political form of rule was replaced by an economic one, and it's important too that. What she's saying here means that capitalism did not emerge as a result of different com competing classes. Rather, it is a set of social relations that implicates all classes. And she says peasants everywhere and at other times had availed themselves of market opportunities. But English farmers were distinctive in their degree of subjugation to market imperatives. And she'll go into this to explain the reasons why looking at English history a little bit more. Uh, and I'll talk about this in, in future slides. <clears throat> but again, market imperatives, this is key, a key term for her. So farmers were driven off the land less as a result of direct appropriation and more due to market imperatives. And in, in my previous talk on Marx's capital, I 
identified just a, a few different methods of primitive accumulation that Marx touches on. Uh, and market imperatives was one of those. But for, for Mason's Wood, this is the most important, right? And it should also be stated, by the way, that, that I don't think Mason's Wood really um, uh, touches on this in detail, but primitive accumulation as well is also an ongoing process. And this is the uh, implication of what she's saying as well, another implication of if, if it's a transformation of social relations, it means that it's also an ongoing process. But this is a subject for another talk. Um, and also then, interestingly, the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie um, are not the instigators. They're not the beginning of this process, but rather the end of it. And Brenner also critiqued the idea of a bourgeois re revolution, because if there was already a bourgeoisie, then why would they need to revolt in the first place? This is really interesting, because the idea of a bourgeois revolution um, was very important for post-war Marxists in Japan, especially, and, and liberals as well, who thought that Japan had not uh, adequately escaped the bonds of feudalism, and it needed to have a bourgeois revolution first. They're the bourgeoisie, they're usually saying this. Why would they need to revolt in the first place if they already exist? doesn't make sense. So the bourgeoisie is not necessarily the same as capitalists, and moreover, the bourgeoisie do not necess they're not necessarily the initiators of capitalism. And she goes on to look also at one more important uh, historian, E.P. Thompson, who also saw market conditions emerging before industrial proletariatization, and industrial capitalism. Like Brenner, this had little to do with technological advances, which were roughly the same in England and France, and more with property relations, where landowners, peasants, tenants, all became subject to market imperatives and the, quote, need to increase productivity and profit. Similarly, the factory system was more the result and less the cause. This is why Thompson was not concerned with industrialization and the new market was imposed by state repression. Okay, so fairly positively evaluates E.P. Thompson here and draws from some of his indications as well. <clears throat> okay, and looking at chapter four, commerce or capitalism. Typical, typical accounts tie capitalism to cities. When restraints on trade was freed, the bourgeoisie developed uh, along with capitalism but there were many other types of cities, she points out, which were not centered on <clears throat> the market and trade. Even if they had commerce, they were also maybe not subject to market imperatives. She points out Florence, Italy, for example, which was a very prosperous and mercantilist city, but capitalism didn't emerge there. Meanwhile, England had a monarchy, and it was not too interconnected, yet capitalism emerged there. So why? This doesn't fit the idea of the mercantilist commercialization model, right? If, if, that, if their theory of history was true, why didn't capitalism emerge in these cities that were very focused on trade? Why did it emerge in a relative backwater like England? In pre-capitalist societies, there was trade and profit, yet they were not subject by market imperatives to produce, productivize, and to compete. Pre-capitalist trade was largely just shuttling specialized goods from one region to another. There was also extra economic competition between powers. What she means by this is basically military force and fighting and wars. But the aim was not to, pro to lower production costs, and most profits were not derived from surplus value on production. It was derived from elsewhere, from buying and selling or extracting it through military force. Trade was also more about luxury goods, and profit was made in circulation, not production. Again, this is all pre-capitalist trade. And people didn't depend on, market, on the market for their livelihoods. <laughs> so she's showing here why, why capitalism doesn't emerge from trade. There was trade in Europe before, but it was not capitalist, capitalism or capitalist trade. Mainly there was trade in grain from the Baltic region, uh, which was sold at a profit by merchants. And there was trade in luxuries for wealth, uh, wealthy upper classes as well. Grain trade, the grain trade was not a major wealth source in Europe. 
and moreover, the profits made profits were made through the arbit arbitrage of uh, or arbitrage of uh, commodities, not their production. Also, pre-capitalism, tra uh, pre-capitalist trade was predicated on disjointed and geographically separated spaces and places because it's not easy to get commodity A in uh, place X, something like that, right? They make commodity A in one place. Um, they, they can't get it easily somewhere else, but it's the same is true of vice versa. So they have these, you know, demand and these kind of rarities or luxury items that are then traded. She compares Florence with England, and Florence was a major commercial center, but it was, whoa, what's going on, sorry, uh, but it was not capitalist because it relied on extra economic factors like birthright and military power, etc., and Florence was not focused on production or development either. There was no market imperative, in other words, to produce or to develop. She cites the 16th century Dutch Republic as another example. It was highly commercialized and dependent on trade, but it didn't develop industrial capitalism either. And also it was not dependent <clears throat> on capitalist producers, but rather merchants. The Dutch relied heavily on extra economic factors as well for their dominance, uh, for example, military or example military dominance uh, and command of uh, trade routes, monopolies, etc. Also, the Dutch public officers, Dutch public officers were highly paid, or Dutch public office, sorry, was highly paid and sought after. So the ruling classes. Uh, were still in charge, and they extracted surplus from heavy taxes on peasants. Okay, that's where they got their surplus. And this is, you know, pretty common in other kind of so-called feudal states as well, uh, certainly in Japan, uh, where most surplus was extracted in the form of nengu, of uh, taxes paid in rice. When the European the European economy went into decline after 1660. However, England invested in boosting agricultural output, but the Dutch deinvested in this. So this is one uh, divergence, actually, uh, that she points out that is important uh, for understanding the origins of capitalism. Which, as we've seen by now already, and which Mason's Wood stresses, is agrarian. That capitalism emerged in the countryside and quite late. Uh, so there were not these little elements of it here and there present throughout human history wherever trade occurred. No, she says. It emerged in the countryside, in England, quite late. Pre-capitalist societies relied on extra economic means, as I've said. Capitalism transformed these social relations, however, so that peasants lost all access and, di uh, and direct access to the means of production, which in this case was basically land and agricultural land, like farms. Instead, they must sell their labor for a wage, um, and everything becomes mediated by the market. Um, and everything in capitalism is a commodity for the market. It is the, quote, principal determinant and regulator of social reproduction because everyone depends on it. As I've you know, pointed out, um, in a capitalist system, you can't just choose to not be capitalist or to not participate. It's impossible. You, everything. Um, you have to sell something to get something. You have to buy something that is dependent on someone else's exploited labor. So... Everyone uh, depends on these things, and all of the commodities together determine the value in society, ex the quantity of exchange value, um, and hence uh, prices of various things. Okay, so if you bring something to market, even if it if if it's handmade or whatever, it's a handcraft, um, doesn't matter. It's still determined by socially necessary labor time and other kinds of market imperatives that are beyond your control. England pioneered these new capitalist social relations. Why? Because England was unified earlier than other European states, which still had feudal lords. So it developed a national market linked by roads and water, etc. And also the English ruling class allied with the central monarchy. It demilitarized and had no extra economic leverage. So this is also key, right? And the ruling class owned lots of land. 
uh, as well. So it, it depend, relied on tenants because there were less peasants who owned land. So the ruling class tried to gain advantage by having tenants produce more efficiently. This was very different than rentiers, for example, um, or, or feudal societies, um, even though England was feudal, um, but other feudal societies who would extract surplus through coercion. Tenants competed to boost productivity, um, pay better rents, and get access to land. And she says the market mediated relation between, and this was a market mediated relation between landlords and peasants. Surveyors and landlords, moreover, would judge the rent of the land based on how much it is estimated to produce at market value. This was still feudalism. So when feudal lords had lots of power, they could coerce and charge rent um, as well. Whereas in France, where there was less developed capitalism, peasants had more control over the land and could better resist pressures from landlords. So French peasants, peasants had less imperative to develop and produce. So this is her, um, you know, she's painting a more detailed picture of this early type of primitive accumulation, uh, which we've already looked at, okay? And she says here, the famous triad of landlord, capitalist tenant, and wage labor was the result. And with the growth of wage labor, the pressures to improve labor productivity also increased. The same process created a highly productive agriculture, capable of sustaining a large population not engaged in agricultural production, but also an increasing propertyless mass that would constitute both a large wage labor force and a domestic market for cheap consumer goods a type of market with no historical precedent. This is the background to the formation of English industrial capitalism. Okay, so this is a, um, she's quite clear in, in this passage, I think, of, um, you know, how this, how social relations were reformed and how these reformed social relations gave rise to the capitalist mode of production. Those who couldn't compete uh, became or become dispo uh, dispossessed property propertyless classes. This forms a new base for the industrial proletariat. Uh, of course, this is even easier to imagine today. Most of us are not born into this world with huge amounts of property, and we right away. Um, not only have to, um, you know, work for a living, you know, earn a wage, right, uh, do wage labor, but we've internalized this so much now because this has gone on for so long that we take it for granted that we're even also socialized from a young age um, in schools that teach us and prepare us for wage labor, for work, right? So this is just completely taken for granted. But it wasn't still at this time that in history that, that Mason's Wood is talking about. And this is why, again, it's so important, I think, to look at historical origins. Because then these things um, that we're still experiencing today, the reasons for them become quite clear. But returning to this, France, meanwhile, uh, became an absolutist state where the aristocracy became the bureaucracy and extracted heavy taxes from, from peasants. But this doesn't encourage producers. Rather, it discourages production. In England, meanwhile, new relations, uh, relationships further separated the political state and economic powers, i.e. landlords. So this is a little bit similar to what she's saying Perry Anderson said as well, the separation between political and economic powers. Whereas in France, in absolutist France, those two things were still joined political and economic powers, okay? Moreover, this heavily this was heavily tied to the emergence of new uh, political uh, ideas in political economy of, quote, improvement and productivity. The word improve here originally meant to cultivate land for profit, hence the connections, obvious etymological connections, to agrarian capitalism. Note, before 
capitalist improvement, peasants would focus instead on restoring the land, and they also held communal lands. But capitalists saw this as, rather, an obstacle to improvement or profit or production. So they eliminated communal lands and imposed instead private property. And this leads to enclosures. John Locke and many other famous thinkers, liberal thinkers especially, um, were, they, they provided the theoretical basis uh, for this newly emerging system. So John Locke defended private property as a God-given right. His idea was predicated on improvement, which he said comes from labor. So, by the way, um, in classical political economy, uh, the labor theory of value um, um, emerged at the fore, and, and it was, for most classical political economists, was, was uh, you know, accepted um, that, yeah, okay, value comes from labor, right? But, but then the conclusions they draw from those are very different, and how far they develop them as well is very different, and it's only Marx who provides a critique of the political economists and their ideas of uh, value. Um, but for John Locke, anyway, private property trumped common ownership because unimproved land for him was just waste. So anyone who took it for private property and improvement was doing good. And you can clearly see how this would justify colonialism. And indeed, Mason's Wood spends a whole chapter looking at this later. John Locke wrote about labor, improving land, but what he really meant was profit, the exchange value drawn out of the land um, and exchange value serving as or as the basis of property. This justified colonial expansion and expropriation, and he also um, equated his servant's labor with his property. Okay, interesting, right? He saw owners of the land as producers and not the actual workers. So here we already have a, a big difference in the understanding of uh, the labor theory of value. A note that this conception still holds today. Um, I can't remember who it was, but oh, maybe it was like Mitt Romney or something like that, a politician in the U.S. who said, um, you know, a number of years back, maybe a decade ago, uh, that you know, corporations are people too, right? Or the idea of, um, you know, business owners and, and very rich people as being like job creators, right? In, in an, uh, a cynical way, that's kind of true. Um, but it's still drawing on this idea of, um, it's, you know, the owners of land as the ones who... Uh, create value, not the actual workers. And productive, too, implies improving private property to make a profit. Locke criticized rentiers and merchants as parasitic because they don't produce. He only praised landlords who he saw as sources of wealth. You can kind of see the, the feudal um, context that he's still you know, partly writing in as well, that, oh, these people, they just own land, these feudal aristocrats, but they're not interested in um, improving it. They're not interested in making it better, right? You know, he saw that as just a, a waste. Um, and this idea of rentierism as parasitic as well uh, is still very popular even in, um, in, in economics today. Uh, so Locke served the contemporary function of justifying landlords, private property, and enclosures. And this notion of the origins of capitalism uh, changed. Anyway, she, she kind of switches gears here, but says that, uh, anyway, this notion of the origin of capitalism, of social relations and agrarian capitalism and emerging in the English countryside, uh, changes common notions of class conflict. Um, and she goes into more detail on this. In France, economics was controlled by the absolutist state. So there, the target of rebellion was the state. But the French state also worked to protect peasants because it needed their surplus labor, which came from taxes, right? 
But in England, there was no such close link between landlords and the state. They competed for control of property instead of state office. And this meant increased economic exploitation, for example, enclosures. This destroys the idea that capitalism was advanced by, a, by the bourgeoisie who threw off the shackles of feudalism. This idea of a bourgeois revolution, in other words, does not make any sense. As we've already pointed out, if there was already a bourgeoisie, why would they need to have a revolution? And then as she points out here, that there, the ways they approached power and the methods they, they attempted to achieve power were different. Um, and she says, rather, it might be closer to the truth to say that capitalism was advanced by the, asser the assertion of the landlord's power against the peasants' claims to customary rights. This is, this is key, I think, here. So what were the English revolutions about? It was not the bourgeoisie throwing off feudalism, but rather peasants protesting property forms of capitalist development. In France, the revolution was bourgeois. But it was more about tensions with the absolute estate than advancing capitalism. The English Revolution, however, was not a conflict between the bourgeoisie and the state aristocracy. Rather, rich landlords could advance their rights in Parliament and promote capitalism. Sorry, my voice is a little scratchy today, so I have to uh, <clears throat> profusely drinking uh, water here. But... Going on to chapter 6, Agrarian Capitalism and Beyond. So she dwells on this um, origin place of capitalism. Then There's this popular image of an idyllic English countryside, but this, of course, is a recent myth. Most peasants uh, were quite poor, and the countryside was full of poor villagers. But England agrarian or English agrarian capitalism dispossessed them. It drove all these people off the land, made them propertyless, um, forced their proletariatization, and drove them into big city centers. Instead, territorial aristocrats who lived off tenant rents bought up huge tracts of land, kicking the villagers off, and building huge country mansions instead. And when you go to the English countryside today, you can go and tour some of these mansions and you know, there's this idyllic image of this beautiful, peaceful past, right? But, again, it's a myth. Uh, their peak was the 18th century, and this created conditions for mass exploitation of the land, uh, especially environmental destruction. Was agrarian capitalism really capitalist, she asks, and answers yes. Although only a portion of the population was dependent on wages, the effects were to make producers market dependent. This is the market imperatives. And this happened before mass proletariatization. Okay? So again, as I always point out, you know, uh, you make a handicraft and you bring it to the market, its prices are still determined by forces beyond your control. So you're still subject to market imperatives. You buy something at the market, that price is determined by market imperatives too, right? Beyond your control. So even if only a portion of the population um, abides by these new, emer newly emerging social relations, it doesn't matter. It has an outward expanding effect until it encompasses everything. Anyway, these capitalist relations made English uh, agriculture really productive. And this fueled industrialization. The urban population in England explodes because of dispossession. The propertyless mass was growing rapidly, she writes. Moreover, the population disproportionately gathered in London, which became the largest city in Europe. England then developed a distinctive national economy centered on London and catering to the, its domestic market. More and more people became dependent on this market because dispossession and growing dependence on because of dispossession and growing dependence on wage labor. This is key as well. Independent farmers used to own the means of production and produce much of their reproduce much of their livelihoods by themselves or within their own community spheres. But they don't have this anymore. They don't have the means of production, so now they have to buy everything and they have to sell their labor as wage labor. Historians focus too much on the growth of, quote, consumer society. And as she said, markets and trades and goods existed long before. What was new 
was that more people were now dependent on the market for access to even basic necessities. They were compelled to buy. New market, uh, the new, this new market, capitalism, compelled workers to work more, faster, and cheaper so that they could manufacture cheaper goods for themselves to buy. So it tries to compensate for cheap wages with cheaper mass-produced goods, and, and this is still, uh, you know, holds true today. World capitalism then emanated from English agrarian capitalism. And, and this is Megson's would, you know, her big argument, right? Um, many people disagree with this, but um, at the same time, many other Marxist historians, you know, generally hold uh, similar views. The industrial, uh, uh, industrial capitalism and industrialization wouldn't have been possible without a large proletariat, um, which was dispossessed because of agrarian capitalism, as she's shown. So capitalism was not a product of technology nor the industrial revolution. Rather, it was the other way around. This is also key, you know. Uh, is new technology going to spur new um, ways of interacting? Is it going to change human society? Is it going to change social relations? Well, who knows about the future? But if you just look at the past, um, a critical Marxist historian would say no, it's not. Because new forms of technology do not change social relations. Rather, it's the other way around. The social relation determines the form of technology. Right? Moreover, this created new class relations. Uh, the mass proletariat was entirely dependent on the whims of the market for access to the basic means of reproduction. This is uh, capitalist uh, development then in England, market imperatives. Uh, were also then spread and opposed, imposed around the world. People and producers were compelled to produce for the global market, and thus transform social, uh, thus transform social relations domestically. Okay, so she's showing here then how these market imperatives are not just limited to, they start in a domestic economy, but um, no uh, society is an island to itself, Everyone is interconnected, and then capitalism in this way spreads globally so that everyone becomes market dependent on this global market. Uh, and as I've said, note that tech does not transform social relations, but rather it's the other way around. So now she goes back to this idea, um, which was kind of first touched on when she talked about John Locke, the origin of capitalist imperialism. So, she, but she problematizes this idea of a simple connection between capitalism and imperialism. England was actually an imperialist, imperialist latecomer, but it had the most advanced capitalism. Spain, on the other hand, was a major imperialist, think about, you know, colonizing and conquest in the New World, but was a latecomer to capitalism. So, it's not so simple to say that, uh, slavery fueled uh, industrial, and it's not so simple to say that slavery fueled industrial capitalism either because states had slavery but not so developed capitalism. So it's not so much these things but rather more about domestic social property relations, she says. Uh, then capitalist states like England imposed market imperatives on other states. So what she's saying here is um, it's a different kind of imperialism. It's still imperialism. It's a different kind of imperialism. It uses different means and methods um, and different justifications. Imperial expansion followed the logic of pre-capitalist states up until this point. It was exploitation through extra economic means, usually military force, which would squeeze out surplus labor on, on the cheap and then appropriate or sell um, the products of this for a large profit. Some pre-capitalist uh, imperialism was focused on trade. Spain just collected gold and getting precious commodities. France and, and its relationship with Canada um, were focused on the fur trade, so they were just extracting one commodity rather than focused on capitalist development or production. But capitalist imperialism was different. And England first imposed this in Ireland. It was an economic hegemony uh, 
to impose a new econ economic model. The um, expropriated, uh, one minute, I don't know what my slide says here, but uh, I think I want to say land in Ireland was expropriated and given to English settlers who would use superior technology to increase productivity. And expropriated um, Irish people now became tenants. So this uh, agrarian capitalist model is first replicated in the society, and this is kind of how capitalist imperialism works. So the idea was to develop then the colony to a degree, but not so much, not too much, that it would, uh, so that it doesn't become a competitor. And Engler, England later repeated this model in the New World. And this model also was adopted all over the world and remains in place today. But now the role of the old role of colonial powers uh, is replaced by capitalist nation states who impose or enforce the laws of the market on their populace. And Lockean notions of property rights underwrote colonial expansion and dispossession of native peoples. Because John Locke said uh, there was a natural right to property, or the natural right to property was only obtained if one added productive, meaning exchange value, to the land, which Native Americans, for example, did not because they were non-capitalist and non-monetary society. For John Locke, though, this, quote, unimproved land was, quote, waste. Moreover, so if the land, in his view, doesn't produce exchange value, it's, it's waste for him, right? And this is, this is actually um, the, the basis of capitalism, of course. I mean, and it's, it's taken for granted today, right? That if land's just sitting there, oh, it's just open for the exploitation, and it's just, you know, unused resources, right? Just trees and, and beautiful rivers and stuff like that. Capitalists just see these as resources being uh, awaiting exploitation, right? Um, moreover, this value was based on agrarian capitalist standards, uh, English agrarian capitalist standards. Okay, so, for example, if a specific plot of land in England should yield uh, such and such amount of a particular uh, food product, okay, then that determines the price of the land and its kind of rate of productivity, if you will. But land everywhere else at that time in the Americas, for instance, is not, it doesn't operate on that principle. But for Locke and other capitalists and liberals, it didn't matter because it was, their land was judged by English standards. This amount of land should be able to produce this much. Okay, it should have this much value or something like that, right? So all of America and most of the globe was up for the taking since it couldn't yet produce as much as England. And the same argument was made earlier by uh, England in the case of, uh, quote, wild Ireland. So English capitalism um, was made much clearer through the process of imperialism. And of course, before Ireland, in England itself, where unproductive land there too was deemed to be waste. More importantly, capitalist imperialism uh, done for, was done for private property and private profit. The actions of the state were undertaken by private agents, so you can't detach the state from private property. Capitalist imperialism uh, gives imperialism uh, economic justification as opposed to earlier just moral justifications. Like, um, even though there were, you know, still uh, elements of both of those present, I think. Uh, now, though, colonizers were doing God's will because they were adding value to society. So she looks at the relations then between capitalism and the emerging nation state. And again, both of these things emerge side by side. Did one give rise to the other? Which was it? Which came first? It's a chicken and egg. Is it a chicken and egg scenario? Well, as we'll see as I go through the slide, it's not so simple. They emerged in tandem. They played off each other. Um, but it's not a case per se of one giving rise to the other. Feudal states had porous boundaries. Some were centralized monarchies, 
um, but there were no clear-cut boundaries anyway. You, know, you look at a map and say, this is the dividing line. This is where um, the United States ends and Canada begins, right? Well, pre-capitalist um, and, and um, or feudal, na feudal nation sta or feudal states, sorry, were not necessarily like that. Um, in France, they there um, the abs they pioneered the absolutist state. This was like centralized feudalism, she says. An office there came with property. So if you have hold public office in the absolutist state, you get some property with that and a set salary, etc. But in England, um, England was more unified than elsewhere in Europe. And there was a unitary national parliament, etc., and a unified national economy centered on London. Landlords relied on economic, economic exploitation, while the state enforced, enforced private property. So, so this here is pretty key. This is one of the major connections between capitalism and the nation state. Capitalism doesn't produce modern nation, nation states, nor vice versa. But capitalism does bring the nation-state to fruition. And she says, the transformation of politically constituted property into capitalist property was at the same time and inseparably a transformation of the state. Okay, so just like it's a fundamental principle of all liberal nation-states that private property is sacrosanct. Um, this itself, that fundamental belief of liberal nation states, is also fundamental to capitalism, okay? And then capitalist nation states will protect that with violent military and police force. Um, some see capitalism, of course, as she said, emerging from global trade, but many states were involved in trade and they weren't capitalist. And rather, again, she repeats... Capitalism emerged from domestic internal social relations in England. This gave it an advantage internationally. And capitalism created new imperialist drives, too, as well as it forced uh, market imperatives on other societies. And the state often took a major initiative to reform um, along capitalist lines, for example, German state-led industrialization, and the same could be said for Japan, too, in the Meiji uh, Restoration, where Meiji reformers and, quote, modernizers uh, set out to turn Japan into a modern capitalist nation-state. So states still following a pre-capitalist logic could become effective agents of capitalist development. Capitalism, of course, doesn't erase state boundaries. Rather, it reproduces national economies. Capitalism needs the nation-state despite arguments about globalization overcoming the nation-state. Capitalism relies on the state for various ec extra-economic support, for example, limiting workers' movements across borders and uh, using police, etc., to enforce them. Uh, feudalism was bound by the extent of extra-economic influence over producers, right? You, your military can only be so strong and have uh, so far of a reach. But capitalism did actually not have these bonds. It was a distinctive form of class domination and, imperial, and imperialism. Um, but... Uh, what do I want to write here? Let's see. Contradiction. There was a contradiction, yes, uh, because capitalism also relied on extra economic power of the state to enforce the global system of private property. This means that capitalism remains dependent on extra economic conditions uh, as well as political and legal supports. And capitalism also relies on maintaining unequal and uneven development. For example, there are some poor producing nations and some rich consuming ones. Uh, and, quote, exploitable, low-cost labor regimes. Okay, and then in the last chapter, um, Mason's Wood gives a really interesting discussion on modernity, ideas of modernity and post-modernity. I'm personally very interested in this for my own uh, research, um, looking at uh, modernization theory and, and what does it mean to be modern and what have people associated with 
uh, the term modernity. And Mason's Wood has some really uh, interesting salient observations about this. So capitalism is historically specific, as we have established. Um, it's not necessarily a product of the French Enlightenment, okay? This is also very important, because a lot of bourgeois liberals and others, and even Marxists, and people who hold on to the idea of a, a bourgeois revolution, um, like to tie capitalism and modernity and the Enlightenment together. Even, you know, postmodernists take this for granted. But, as we've seen, right, the bourgeois did not create capitalism, and capitalism did not emerge in France. So there's already this idea of it emerging from the Enlightenment is very problematic. Um, as we said, again, the bourgeoisie were not a capitalist class. They didn't like all the high, they didn't like all the high positions in state and society being monopolized by the aristocracy. So they adopted the language of universalism as opposed to privilege. And this is the role of the bourgeoisie. This is what they did in the Enlightenment, okay? They also attacked the aristocracy and the church because they, those two institutions were not taxed. They were not opposed, however, to monarchy per se, and their focus on rationality was inherited from the absolutist state. So, in other words, the French Enlightenment was not really about class struggle. But what about in England? It was capitalist, but it actually didn't emphasize rationality. Rather, it emphasized, and liberals there emphasized, the unplanned, invisible hand of the market. England instead was more focused on improvement, as we've shown, meaning making private property more productive for capital. It was here, and not in the Enlightenment, that we can find the roots of contemporary ecological destruction. So what critics of the Enlightenment miss is that many contemporary social ills attributable to cap are attributable to capitalism and not the Enlightenment. Okay, this is quite key. Postmodernists totally misunderstand the Enlightenment and, modernity, and modernism or the modernity because they equate the two with capitalism. The idea of postmodernity, she says, is derived from a conception of modernity that, at its worst, makes capitalism historically invisible, or at the very least, naturalizes it. Okay, so postmodernists would argue against many of these uh, claims of modernity, but they both take it for granted that modernity equals capitalism in their view. Okay, which brings us to the conclusion. And what are some, what are some of the key points that we can say about this text? Um, well, what I think is that we're all implicated in market imperatives, which means that we are all tied up in the exploitation of ourselves and others. And even if the means of production were collectively owned, within a capitalist system, they would still have to compete for profit, meaning they would still be subject to market imperatives. So this is very problematic. Uh, and now, even proponents of capitalism are being forced to confront capitalism's destructive sides, such as environmental destruction and uh, growing inequality. I, I just read an article the other day in the Harvard Business Review or something like that, I think, um, arguing, for, um, arguing for businesses to, to take more of a uh, flexible approach toward degrowth even. So, so there are you know, even businesses and major corporations and the capitalist class are recognizing, or also ideas of green growth, by the way, uh, really tie into this, um, are realizing that uh, there's this, that yeah, capitalism has these destructive sides, but they don't want to get rid of capitalism, okay? Um, they just want to kind of um, alter its packaging and rebrand it a little bit. Um, and for countries that try to follow the uh, Western model of capitalist development, there is often less of the good and more of the bad to go around. So it's becoming 
you know, very uh, obvious anyway for everyone involved, basically, that capitalism is fundamentally unsustainable and that there's no such thing as green or sustainable growth within this. But that's probably a topic for another discussion. Okay, which brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, so thank you very much for, uh, for listening. I hope that you'll check out this book. There's many other keen observations in it that I wasn't able to uh, touch on or that I may have missed um, in, in my reading. Uh, but anyway, this is going to, as I said, provide um, kind of a, a platform for a theoretical platform for us to jump off from uh, as we move ahead and look at um, many other uh, aspects of the history of capitalism, uh, not just in England, of course, uh, but globally. So thank you very much.